Abraham Lincoln, The Middle Section by the Villalobos. Often for days at a time, Abe stayed alone in the woods, chopping timber. It was so quiet in the forest, they had plenty of time to think and dream. At mealtimes, he shared his food with the squirrels, and in return, they had to listen to the speeches he made up. The squirrels blinked their small brown eyes, and the trees seemed to sway and bow in agreement with what he said. He made a poem for his sister Sally, and when she married and left home, he read it to her at her wedding. Abel also left home for a while to be a ferryman on the Ohio River. The great Ohio River flowed by some miles from Little Pigeon Creek, and it was there that he made his first dollar. Two elegant travelers gave him a shiny half dollar each for rowing them out to the steamboat that lay anchored in midstream. But he stood there in his ferryboat, wondering that anyone could pay so much for so little work. One of the coins slipped from between his fingers. Sadly, Abe saw half of his new wealth vanish in the depth. But Abe hadn't much time to grieve over his loss. Too many things happened on the river. He looked wide-eyed at the boats and listened to tales of the outside world. Then one day, one of the neighboring farmers sent Abe himself out into the world. With a flat boat loaded with hogs and corn, the farmer's son and Abe set off to go all the way down to New Orleans to trade. They drifted with their boat down the Ohio and into the great Mississippi River. There, Abe needed all his strength and quick thinking to steer clear of many dangers. Paddle wheel steamers splashed up and down the river so hard that the water turned into foam above them. Flatboats and keelboats and houseboats and strings drifted into their path. Dangers lurked behind every bend. Sandbars were washed up by the current and struggling trees sticking up from the bottom threatened to pin the boat up in the air like a beetle. Along the shore, river pilots lay in hiding, waiting for nightfall to come. One night, as Abe and his friend had made fast their boat on the bank, five vicious pirates came sneaking on board to rob them. But they hadn't counted on the strength of Big Abe. He grabbed an oar fought them all at once, and chased them far into the swamp. Abe could never forget this night for the rest of his life. He had a white scar over his eyebrows. The further south they drifted, the more Negro slaves they saw working in cotton fields, and when at last they came to New Orleans, there were black slaves everywhere. Some were running about with loads on their heads, other were led in chains through the streets to be sold as slave markets, and Abe saw how Negroes were trotted up and down like horses to show they were strong and healthy. The Negro mothers were weeping, for they never knew if they would ever see their little babies again when they were sold. Sometimes the one who brought the mother would refuse to take the children, and they'd be sold to someone else, and a family would be broken up. Abe Lincoln thought this was cruel, and when the cargo and the flatbed sold, he was glad to go north again to his home in Indiana, where everyone was free. There, all the neighbors came to hear him tell of his adventures out in the big world. They never tired of hearing about the river pirates and slave markets, and they all grinned broadly when he told of the fortune teller who had said that one day Abraham Lincoln would be president of the United States. Abe's father was listening to stories about Illinois the new prairie state where folks said the grass grew greener than anywhere else. <clears throat> I reckon he'll be, will be moving on, he said one day. So one early spring morning, the Lincoln set off again, this time in a wagon so huge a seven yoke op team had to pull it. The wagon was crowded, for many relatives moved with them. They traveled on for two weeks through forests and swamps and rolling prairie. On long legs, Abe walked in front to peddle pins and buttons. When once in a while they passed a farm, when they came to the Sagamon River in Illinois, they liked the land and put up a cabin. Abe split mountains of rails for fence. One thousand rails he split for a neighbor to get himself a pair of jeans. That was much work for a pair of pants. But then his legs were long, too, so it took many yards of cloth to cover them. And when spring came, he said goodbye to his father and his stepmother, put his belongings into a bundle, threw it over his shoulder, and set out into the world to try his luck. For now he'd reached 21 years and was free to do as he pleased. There's him walking later to go on his way. That's all he needed 
to carry everything he owned other than what he was wearing. A little further down the Sagamon River in the village of New Salem, it had only a few dozen houses, but even Chicago did not have more at that time. There were several stores in New Salem, and a man named Offit was planning to open a new one. On one of his trips upriver, Offit met Tall Abe and hired him as a clerk in the store he was going to open. But first he sent him down to New Orleans with goods to sell. Abe built a flatboat himself and drifted down the Sagamon River. But off New Salem, a miller had built a dam across the river, and on this mill dam the flatboat stuck. All the people village on the village stood on the bank and waited to see the flatboat sink. But Abe bored a hole in the boat and tipped it so the water could flow out, and slowly the float ba boat slid over the dam. Then he put a wedge in the hole and drifted on down the river. This there was a mighty smart fellow, everyone said. Off it went around bragging and betting that his huge new clerk was not only smart enough to outwit them all, but so strong that he could outrun, outjump, and outfight any man in the county. So when Abe came back to New Salem, all the strong boys were straining about like cocks, eager to measure their strength against his. And Ab had to make good off its words. He wrestled with the strongest and toughest of them and threw them to the ground. Then the beaten boy and all the people cheered and said Abe was the strongest man in the county. From that day on, they accepted him as one of their own. They loved his funny ways and jokes, and they nicknamed him Honest Abe. Once he charged a woman six and a quarter cents too much, he walked three miles to catch her up up with her and pay her back. <coughs> but Abe's honesty wouldn't wasn't enough to keep off its store going. The debts grew bigger and bigger and one morning off it was gone. There stood Abe without a job. But just then the men in New Salem were called to war, for an Indian chief, Black Hawk, had come back to Illinois with his warriors. His tribe had sold the land to the pale faces, but Black Hawk said, Man ye do, the great spirit gave us the land, it couldn't be sold. Sold is sold, said the people of Illinois, and went to war to chase the Indians out. Abe Lincoln went to war as a captain, for the men from each village who had, had the longest row of men lined up behind him was elected captain, and twice as many men lined up behind Abe as behind his rival. But his soldiers had never taken orders from any man before, and Captain Abe Lincoln struggled hard to make them obey him. There was all the fight that was all the fighting he had, for Black Hawk and his warriors fled before the soldiers. One day a peaceful old Indian came walking into camp. The soldiers were angry and wanted to kill him, but Abe said, Anyone who touches him must fight me first. Because Abe, cause Abe was the strongest, they had to obey. Soon after the Black Hawk was taken prisoner and the Indian War was over. Abe went back to New Salem, and he and another man named Barry decided to open a store of their own. Both were poor, but Abe's word was good as gold, so they borrowed the money, bought the goods, and started to trade. Very soon, Abe's friends were saying he was too clever to stand behind the counter all day long. He should go around making speeches so the people would elect him to go to the capital of Illinois. Abe thought this was a good idea, so he began going about making speeches and joking with the people. When he had mounted a tree stump, he started, I am humble Abe Lincoln, and the people liked what he said in his funny ways, and they elected him. Every spring he went to the capital. The rest of the year he took care of his store. But all the time he studied to become a lawyer, and it happened that one day, as he was standing in his store, a covered wagon stopped at the door, and a stranger came in with a barrel of old stuff he wanted to sell. Abe had no need of the barrel, but he bought it for half a dollar to help the man. And then he opened the barrel he found at the bottom of the book, a book he needed to study law. From then on, Abe lay most of the time on the counter and <clears throat> studied the book, and the schoolmaster helped him with the grammar and the English. In the meantime, Barry took care of the store, but instead of selling the goods, he ate and drank the whole day, and at last he died. There was Abe with all the debt. <clears throat> it was more than a thousand dollars he owed, his store was taken away from him, and all that he owned was sold at an auction. Abe's father had taught him, if you make a bad bargain, hug it all the tighter. So instead of running away, Abe stayed and toiled to pay back all the debts. 
His friend believed in him, and most of all, a girl whose name was Anne Rutledge. She was sure he would become a great man some day if he would just go on with his studies, and then they would be married and be happy ever after. But one day, Anne Rutledge took sick, and nothing could be done to save her life. From that day on, it was as if a there were two Abes, the one who was funny and full of good stories. The other was so sad and sorrowful, no one dared to approach him. But he did his work and finished his studies, and one morning he took leave of his friends in New Salem. He borrowed a horse, and sad and penniless, he rode off to Springfield, the capital of Illinois, to become a lawyer. In Springfield, he hitched up his horse on the main square and went to the store of Joshua Speed to ask the price of betting. I have no money, but if I succeed, I'll pay you back, he said to Speed. But Speed felt sorry for the sad-faced Abe and told him to take his things upstairs and share his own bed for nothing. From that time on, Joshua Speed was Abe Lincoln's best friend. He took him to the homes of all his elegant friends, and Abe bought himself store clothes, put a stovepipe hat on his head, and by and by in the country lad was changed into a well-known lawyer. From the prairie all of Brown, people came to ask his advice, for they knew he would be fair and square. And the people in Springfield began to say that the two cleverest men in town were awkward Abraham Lincoln and stylish Judge Douglas. The one was fat and small, the other was lean and tall, and they both courted Mary Todd, a lady from Kentucky. She was dainty and witty, with a tongue so sharp that few people but Abe could tongue-tie her. <clears throat> Little Miss Todd liked the tall Abe Lincoln, but she liked Judge Douglas, too. He was elegant and important, and Mary was as proud as she was witty. She had great plans for her future. The man I'm going to marry <clears throat> will be president of the country, she said. It took her a long while to make up her mind which of her suitors to choose, for they were both very clever men. At last she chose Abe, and they were married. They did not have much to begin with, for Abe had debts which he had to pay back, but Mary saved and helped them. They paid off the debts, and then they bought a house of their own. It was different from Abe's old home. It was painted white and had green shutters. There were many rooms with stylish furniture, lazy curtains, and plush carpets. In a few years, they had three noisy little boys who crawled all over Long Abe while he lay reading on the soft carpet in the parlor.